Well, sure, I'm a culture warrior and I'm a culture celebrator. At the same time, because I've, I've got a mind and heart big enough to take in both these elements. The trouble with these warring factions in their self-regarding stupidity is that they, they can't make that move. Cardinal George understood this. And, and all the figures I mentioned understood this. And that's the equilibrium that we're, that we're losing today, I fear, and why we need someone like him to remind us. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the senior publishing director at Word on Fire. The Catholic Church seems locked in constant disagreement, often between so-called liberal Catholics and conservative Catholics. But is there a third way to lead us out of this quagmire? Well, the late Cardinal Francis George offered a compelling answer, and it's one that we'll discuss today with one of his great uh, mentees, Bishop Robert Barron, who joins us now from Rochester, Minnesota. Bishop, good to see you. Hey, Brandon. Always good to see you. It is a new year, which means a new season of our Bishop Barron Presents series. You've been recording a number of these, which we're going to roll out if they haven't already rolled out already. I wanted to ask you about a couple that you recently recorded. One was with the great Father Joseph Fessio. Uh, tell us about that discussion. It was a delight. Yeah, of course, he's the founder of Ignatius Press and a man who personally knew Henri de Lubac and Hans Urs von Balthasar and Josef Ratzinger. And is probably the one in our country most responsible for bringing their thought into the mainstream. So we talked a lot about those relationships. I found that fascinating. What was it like to be with Balthasar? And what was it like to be in a seminar with Ratzinger? Um, the story I found very moving was he, the older Henri de Lubac, he was a cardinal, so an old man at this time. And Fessio had arrived in, in Paris after the long journey. He wanted to say mass. He's in de Lubac's apartment where there's a small chapel. And he said next to him knelt uh, Cardinal de Lubac, uh, humbly serving his mass. And so I just love those stories. And, and we those and many more I was able to get out of Father Fessio. So I loved it. So if that one hasn't already aired, we'll be sure to, to share it on YouTube, yeah. and then we'll add the audio here to the podcast. Second discussion you had was with another interesting man named Ro Khanna. He is a congressman from your previous state of California. Tell us more about him and how that conversation went. Yeah, he's the representative from, I think it's District 17 in California uh, in the Congress. And it, it's basically Silicon Valley. So in his district, we have, you have Apple and Google and Facebook and and he's become a, a prominent figure on the national scene, uh, often appearing on programs and commenting. He's a Democrat, of course, and holds some positions that I would have you know, very strong disagreement with. In other ways, I think he, he finds common ground with uh, Catholic social teaching. So we, we knocked that around quite a bit. I, I liked him personally very much, and we had a really lively conversation. Um, and that's the way I put it with him. I said, I, I want to just talk to you not as a liberal or a conservative, but as someone representing Catholic social teaching. Um, so it was, I think, a pretty compelling conversation. Well, today I want to talk with you about one of your mentors and heroes, Cardinal Francis George. Cardinal George passed away back in 2015, 2015 I believe it was, yeah. so almost eight years ago. But like many great figures, his words continue to resonate years after his death. In fact, every few months I see him quoted or you know, an old homily or an old article and there's one that's currently making the rounds uh, about this divide between conservative Catholics and liberal Catholics. It stems back to some observations he made in 2004. At that time, he was just Archbishop Francis George. In fact, he gave this homily, which I'll quote from in a minute. And the very next day, was it was announced that he would be Cardinal Francis George. So this is right during that transition. Before we get to his comments, though, tell us for those who don't know Cardinal George a little bit about him. Who was he? Yeah, he was a great man, and as you say, a great mentor to me. He was a Oblate of Mary Immaculate. He's from Chicago. He's a Chicago native. Became a member of the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, which is a missionary order. But he was drawn very early into academic work. He loved the life of the mind and books. And he taught at, um, he got a doctorate at Tulane University, and then taught for many years in OMI institutions and universities. Then he became um, a high-ranking official in the OMI world, ending up in Rome. I think he was called the vicar of the order. And in that capacity, he traveled uh, 
the world. He also got a second doctorate when he was in Rome. So very accomplished man, both intellectually and pastorally. And then he was, during the John Paul II years, he was drawn into the life of a bishop. He became Bishop of, of Yakima, Washington, was there for a short time. And then he was, if for even shorter time, in uh, Portland, Oregon. He was archbishop there for about nine months. And then Joseph Bernardine died, uh, the man who ordained me to the priesthood many years ago. And so Chicago was open. And he had emerged by that time as a, as a candidate. So he was made Archbishop of Chicago in 1997. Um, and then I, you know, pretty quickly fell in with him because I was a professor at the seminary and we shared a lot of, you know, similar intellectual interests and all that. And I always enjoyed his company. And then he also was the one that drew me into this more evangelical work. He felt that there was a need following John Paul II to evangelize the culture. And so in many ways, I've argued he's like the grandfather of Word on Fire because he's the one who inspired me to do uh, this work. And I've just, gosh, Brandon, in so many ways, I'll go back to him. I'll say, well, you know, as Cardinal George said, well, you know, there'll be a debate. I'll say, yeah, but, you know, Cardinal George really resolved this or Cardinal George saw this more clearly. So he's someone that has just um, stayed very much in my mind and heart over the years. And then it's, it's ironic, he died in the spring of 2015, I think April, I was named a bishop two months later, three months later, and then went to California. Um, so I, I, I never, he never knew me as a bishop. It happened right after uh, he died. But I've always felt that he sort of accompanied me uh, during these years. Well, again, the, the evening before he was named a cardinal, he gave this homily at Old yeah. St. Patrick's Church in Chicago. I'm yeah. sure you're familiar with it. You know it well. And yeah. then he later expanded that homily into an article for Commonweal. Yeah. The article was titled, How Liberalism Fails the Church. But don't let the title deceive you. He he takes equal critical shots at both liberal conservative, uh, liberal and conservative Catholicism. But let's start with the, the liberal critique he makes. He, I'm going to quote a little bit at length here, about a paragraph. He says, we are at a turning point in the life of the church in this country. Liberal Catholicism is an exhausted project, essentially a critique, even a necessary critique at one point in our history. It is now parasitical on a substance that no longer exists, end quote. So Cardinal George describes liberal Catholicism as a necessary critique at one point in our history What's he referring to? What's it critiquing? Right. See, that statement is famous and it's typical Cardinal George. It needs a lot of unpacking. I think what he means is this. Um, go back before the council. Uh, he and I shared a lot of the same heroes. Uh, Thomas Merton and Dorothy Day and Omri de Lubach and Josef Ratzinger and Urs von Balthasar and Karol Wojtyla. All of those figures I just mentioned would have been seen in 1950, let's say, as liberals. That's to say they were critical of certain elements within the preconciliar church, especially in, in regard to liturgy, in regard to mission, in regard to ecclesiology. Now, think of the Second Vatican Council, where a lot of these figures were players, and, and their thought was influential at shaping uh, the council. Cardinal George was a man very much of that tradition, it seems to me. He would have liked preconciliar liberalism because he would have seen it as a necessary criticism of certain elements within the preconciliar church that needed criticizing. And then he would have recognized Vatican II as this wonderful moment when the church in its missionary elan, the church in its proper self-understanding, its call to universal holiness, the role of the laity, all of those great themes, he would have said, yes, yes. Now, fast forward to the church where, you know, I came of age. He's, he's a young priest by that time, but I'm a kid coming of age. That a certain form of liberalism perdured after the council that was now uh, counterproductive because it's become parasitical upon a substance that no longer existed. In other words, the, the excesses and, and problems of the preconciliar church had been solved in many ways, by Vatican II. But if the liberal critique continues as it did, it was now counterproductive. And it was, as he put it there, parasitical upon a substance that no longer exists. And it was not able, he felt, to carry forward the great project of, of Catholicism. It had become a um, sort of self-referential, self-destructive um, uh, critical position. So I think that's what he means when he says that. 
he continues in this article from Commonweal, which I'll uh, include a link to this in the show notes so you can read the whole thing. But he says, it, uh, liberal Catholicism, has shown itself unable to pass on the faith in its integrity and therefore in fostering the joyful self-surrender called for in Christian marriage and consecrated life and ordained priesthood. It no longer gives us life. A pretty harsh assessment. Do you still find that true today? Is, is liberal Catholicism fully exhausted, unable to pass on life? Yes, in the measure that it remains a, a, a critical project, it doesn't articulate well the substance of the faith. It doesn't do what John Paul II did so so admirably. John Paul was able to hold up the the kind of the beating heart of the faith and to hold up the beauty and truth and goodness of Catholicism and to propose it as a compelling option in the international conversation. The liberalism that the Cardinal's complaining about here is, again, one that's become fussily turned in in a hypercritical spirit, uh, always ready to see the, the limitations and, and negativity. Well, see, that doesn't inspire people to give their lives to something. Um, you know, that, what's that famous line? Cardinal Dolan always quotes that the people, um, you know, they're not going to give their lives for a question mark. They give their lives for an exclamation point. You know, that if what you're holding up is basically a, a, a critical um, uh, negative position, people aren't going to give their lives to that, which is why I've argued for years Catholic liberalism never gives rise to great vocations. Uh, vocations don't flourish under a liberal uh, regime. Um, John Paul II got that. Mind you, and I think that I'm anticipating your next point, mind you, that's a pre-conciliar liberal who got it. Ratzinger, that's a preconciliar liberal who got it. Baltazar, preconciliar liberal who got it. De Lubach, preconciliar liberal. All those people would have been seen by the conservative establishment of the 50s as sort of radical figures. But they, to my mind, I think to Cardinal George's mind too, legitimately criticized elements that were problematic within preconciliar Catholicism and thereby liberated and gave expression to what was rich and beautiful within it. If, if all you do is continue in the negative tradition without bringing forward the positive, you're going to get this lifeless form that the Cardinal's complaining about. Yeah, let's talk more about that lifeless form, because as he continues, he not only has words against liberal Catholicism, but some sharp words for forms of conservative Catholicism as right. well. Right, and it's very he, important. People what, miss that in, in his analysis. Go ahead. I agree. And again, I think because of the headline, I don't know if the headline came from him or from an editor, but the headline just mentions how liberalism fails the church without mentioning this follow up part that he right, says. So, quote, uh, let me let me read it. to yeah. you. He says, quote, the answer, however, is not to be found in a type of conservative Catholicism obsessed with particular practices and so sectarian in its outlook that it cannot serve as a sign of unity of all peoples in Christ. It makes the same error as liberals in an excessive preoccupation with the church's visible government. Now, I do want to point out that he's criticizing here a type of conservative Catholicism, not whole cloth. But what type is he referring to here? Can I make reference, Brandon, to a hero that he and I uh, have in common? And that's Cardinal Lustiger of Paris. When I was a doctoral student many years ago in Paris, he was the archbishop. And Cardinal George deeply admired Lustiger. In fact, invited him to Mundelein when I was a professor there. Anyway, Lustiger wrote an article. He was, he was a priest. He was a priest of, of Paris. Wrote an article where he said, uh, a plague on the liberal house. So he, he was sharing all of John Paul's and the Cardinal's concerns about liberalism. But in the French context, he also said a plague on the conservative house that simply wants to identify the church with the ancien regime, you know, the pre-revolutionary France, monarchical France, the, that culture from, let's say, the 18th and early 19th century, the triumphalistic political culture of, of that era. And he said a plague on, on the left, a plague on the right, and let's go with you know, this vibrant, beautiful, true, culturally engaged Catholicism. Well, this was an obscure priest, right, in Paris, writes this letter, it appeared someplace. Well, it came to the attention of John Paul II, who was newly elected Pope at that time. And he said, he's my man. 
and he very quickly raised him to, I think he was Bishop of um, Orléans for a short time, and then it came open, he made him Archbishop of Paris. And I think that's very much the Cardinal George's trajectory, is yes, he didn't like liberalism for all the reasons we've been saying, but he also, now again, put Cardinal George in the American context, he didn't want a Catholic conservatism that simply identified itself with a particular cultural form. Call it the the um, America of the 1950s or the liturgical practice of the, of the preconciliar time. He thought that's what rendered Catholicism incapable of engaging the wider culture, of being a really player on the world stage. It became, again, a fussy, inward-looking nostalgia for a lost cultural form. And the point is, Catholicism is meant to transcend all the cultures and therefore able to engage all the cultures. It doesn't get hyper-identified either with 18th century Ancien Régime France or 1950s America. It has a vibrant transcendence, and he saw it in Vatican II. He saw it especially in John Paul II. Again, preconciliar liberal, man of the council par excellence, but Cardinal George saw in John Paul II exactly this, I'm always reluctant to say middle path because that sounds bland. I don't mean it in a bland way, but he saw this, neither this nor that, not conventional liberalism, not, not conventional culturally determined conservatism, but this vibrant, and what's his phrase? Simply Catholicism. Now, George, Lustige, Wojtyla, Ratzinger, de Lubach, that's what they all saw. They all got that. Now, I, I'm going to bring myself briefly into this conversation. This years and years ago, in Chicago, we had this jamboree out on Navy Pier, if people know in Chicago, this beautiful pier that goes out into Lake Michigan. And we had this gathering of Catholics. And the big event was Cardinal George and Andrew Greeley. Andrew Greeley at the time was a very prominent, probably the most famous Catholic in America, you know, more liberal, the Cardinal seems more conservative. Well, they, I, I was brought in as kind of a third wheel, you know, on this thing, and I made my little points. But it was a very interesting, I remember that exchange very well because I think the two of them substantially agreed on the very points we're making right now. And I, it, it was at that meeting that for the first time I said, I like preconciliar liberals. I tend not to like postconciliar liberals. And it's making this same point. And that set the tone for a lot of my own work and my own thinking. So people that have been following me, let's say, especially in the in the Francis era, when there's been so much polarized debate, and watch the moves I've been making. Where did I learn them? I learned them from Lustige. I learned them from Cardinal George. I learned them from Vatican II. I learned them from Wojtyla. I'm trying to make the same moves, right? Of, of a plague on both your houses. I'm for Vatican II. I'm for simply Catholicism. Uh, I still think, Brandon, it's the lively issue that we're facing today. You used a phrase that Cardinal George himself used in this famous article, namely, simply Catholicism. He says, quote, what's the answer? The answer is simply Catholicism and all its fullness and depth a faith able to distinguish itself from any culture and yet able to engage and transform them all. Right. A faith joyful in all the gifts that Christ wants to give us and open to the whole world that he died to save. The Catholic faith shapes a church with a lot of room for differences in pastoral approach, for discussion and debate, for initiatives as various as the peoples whom God loves. But more profoundly, the faith shapes a church which knows her Lord and knows her own identity, a church able to distinguish between what fits into the tradition that unites her to Christ and what is a false start or a distorting thesis, a church united here and now because she is always one with the church throughout the ages and with the saints in heaven. What do you make of that, uh, of that stirring well, cry for simply Catholicism? We could do several shows unpacking that. I'll just mention that very first thing I think he says. It's transcendent to any culture and therefore able to engage every culture. Uh, the danger with a conservatism that hyper-identifies with a particular cultural form is just that, is it becomes limited to that form. Authentic, simply Catholicism, 
in a way, transcends all the cultures, and therefore it can engage them all up and down the centuries and now across the world. Again, look at John Paul II World Youth Day. World Youth Day is not just a nice jamboree for kids. It's embodying this very principle. You know, I've often said the kids coming from all across the world with their individual flags, great, your individual cultures, but the church transcends all those cultures and therefore is able to engage all of them. The reason why, if you just stay at the at the level of, uh, of politics, you're never going to find peace because the, the flags will always start fighting with each other. But the church transcends every culture and therefore engages every culture. Um, that's, that's the answer. And see, we've had this civil war, Brandon, for the past 60 years after Vatican II. And John Paul and company, who articulated this vision, found found the way past the war. And um, sadly, it's been revived in recent years. The Civil War has gotten more intense because I think we've forgotten this principle that he gave eloquent expression to. I love how Cardinal George closes this article. He references the very pope you just did, John Paul II, who was the pope at the time that he gave this homily and wrote the article. He says, quote, the current PBS series on Pope John Paul II, there was a documentary mm -hmm. called John Paul II, The Millennial Pope. He says that documentary raises the question, is this a pope for our times or against our times? The only adequate answer is, both. Both. That is simply Catholicism, <laughs> yeah. he says. Um, how, how must a, a pope and a bishop and a priest and a, every Catholic be both for our times and against our times? And how is that simply well, Catholicism? And may I say, because, you know, as you say all this stuff, Brandon, I'm, I'm getting nostalgic in a way because anyone that's been paying attention to me at all for the past 10 years, they'll they'll understand, oh, that's that's where he's getting it from. That, that's what he's up to. Um this has been the governing principle of, of, of Word on Fire, um, and which is why, which is precisely why we get attacked from both the left and the right. Uh, is the church for the culture? Yes, which is why we look for semi verbi every place. That's, that's why I look to movies and to TV and to the popular culture and, and reaching out to cultural avatars because, yes, there are semi verbi everywhere. There's a... There's a um, self-regarding stupid conservatism that would say, oh no, 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 no. We just kind of we have to just withdraw into our fortress and everything in the culture is is bad. Well no, that's a that's a stupid position. At the same time, am I against the culture? Yes, in many ways. <laughs> I've written many articles and done videos and, and written books about all the demonic and fallen aspects of the culture and the church has to rail against them from age to age. You know, look at today with the abortion, euthanasia. John Paul named it correctly, the culture of death. Um, this kooky self-invention culture that I've been railing against. Cardinal George died before that really reached its its, uh, its high point. Woke culture. I mean, there's so many elements of the culture that are deeply problematic. And so, of course, we attack him. And that's why the left doesn't like me. Oh, he's a culture warrior. Well, sure, I'm a culture warrior. And I'm a culture celebrator. At the same time, because I've, I've got a mind and heart big enough to take in both these elements. The trouble with these warring factions in their self-regarding stupidity is that they, they can't make that move. Cardinal George understood this, and, and all the figures I mentioned understood this, and that's the equilibrium that we're, that we're losing today, I fear, and why we need someone like him to remind us. Let's close with a quest for that very reminder. Cardinal George dies eight years ago. If, if he were still alive today and he was witnessing, let's just to stay within the church, the skirmishes between the Catholics on the right, Catholics on the left, what do you think he would say? He'd say a plague on both your houses and let's get back to simply Catholicism. And he'd say you're, you're both playing a self-destructive game. You're both self-regarding. You're both concerned more about your tribal identity than the church. The church is a big, as he said you know, in that quote you gave, it's a big institution able to take in a lot of different perspectives. It's a both and tradition, not a stupid either or tradition. I think that's what he would say. Um, and that a, a plague on both your houses and stop this silly tribal warfare. Um, and recover the evangelical elan of, a, of an intelligently and beautifully presented Catholicism, if I make bold to speak in his name, you know. <laughs>
Well, it's time now for our listener question. If you have a question for Bishop Barron, you can send it in to us at the website askbishopbarron.com. Today, we have a question from a young girl in Cincinnati. Her name's Amelia. She's got a really thought-provoking question about Jesus. Here's Amelia's question. Hello, my name is Amelia. I am six years old. I am from Cincinnati, Ohio. My question is, did Jesus ever get sick? Thank you, and God bless. That's a good question. Did Jesus ever get sick? Um, you know, I don't know <laughs> if, I think like Augustine Aquinas, if they ever address that question. See, it, it, as the, it, this proves the point I've often made that, see, a, a child in her innocence there is going to ask the, the most penetrating and confounding <laughs> questions. You'd have to get at it, Brandon, how... Um, you know, he's like us in all things but sin, would lead us to say, well, sure, then, you know, he got sick. It's not a sin to be sick, right? On the other hand, is sickness to some degree a function of the fallenness of the world and therefore of sin? Uh, so I suppose that would, if I were Aquinas, that would be my, you know, sed contra and my my respondio and everything. Um, I, you know, don't do sickness at the physical level, but did he feel sorrow? Certainly. You know, and I, I suppose you'd say Adam before the fall wouldn't have experienced sorrow, but Jesus clearly experiences that. He weeps and, and he enters into the anguish of people. And you could say that's a result of, of sin, you know. So in that sense, I, I'd be persuaded to say, yeah, he, he got physically sick. But you know what's good? I, I, honestly, I don't have a good, a good answer. I don't remember any of the great theologians addressing that particular concern. So I got to think about that some more. Well, listen, as we wind up here, I would like to encourage you to join us for the upcoming 2024 Wonder Conference. We had our first ever Wonder Conference uh, a year ago. It focuses on topics relating to faith and science. As you know, one of today's most important evangelical tasks is to debunk the common myth that faith and science are incompatible. Well, the Word on Fire Institute's goal is to bring together renowned experts in physics, philosophy, theology, and history to address this perceived gap and to show how faith and science properly understood are mutually illuminating, especially on this year's topic of nature and the human body. So the actual theme is recovering the natural science and the human body. The conference is going to take place August 2nd through 4th, 2024 at the Rochester Civic Center. So we're coming to Bishop Barron's backyard. Uh, speakers will include Bishop Barron, Heather Hying, John Verveke, Jonathan Paggio, Father Robert Spitzer, Abigail Favalli, Ryan Anderson, and many more. You can find out more details and sign up for the conference by going to the website wordonfire.org slash wonder. The first Wonder Conference sold out very quickly, so I do encourage you, if you want to go, register ASAP. Again, the website's wordonfire.org slash wonder. Well, thanks so much for watching and listening. We'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show. Mm -hmm.